Vermont has a rich history of hauntings and urban legends that can make even the most skeptical people think twice about its tales. Unlike other urban legends from across the U.S., some of the Garden State's dark tales take on a whimsical feel. Join me today as we look at 10 of the many urban legends Vermont has to offer. Glastonbury Mountain and Ghost Town lie in the center of what is known today as the Bennington Triangle in southern Vermont. Legends that surround the mountain date back centuries with Native American lore describing the desolate peak as cursed and ongoing reports of disembodied voices, shadow figures, as well as multiple disappearances. Glastonbury was founded in 1761. Several families tried to live in the area, but for some reason didn't stay long. In 1872, lumber resources were discovered and a railroad was constructed into Glossenberry Mountain. Many workers settled into the area and dozens of kilns were built as the town began to produce charcoal. By the late 1880s, the mountain had been cleared and the town's economy dramatically dropped. In 1889, the railroad stopped operations. In 1894, efforts were made to make the area a tourist attraction, but unfortunately, the winter wiped the railroad out. Population started to dwindle by 1937 and only about seven residents remained and legislator unincorporated the town. Missing people began to be reported in 1945. The first report was of Mitty Rivers, who was an experienced hunting guide. On November 12th, Rivers was guiding four hunters up the mountain and got separated from the group. An extensive search was conducted, but neither Rivers or his body was ever found. A year later, Paula Weldon, a Bennington College student, went for a hike on Long Trail. Many people reported seeing her walking towards Glossenbury Mountain, where Long Trail and Appalachian Trail cross. Paula then disappeared, never to be seen again. Her father did coordinate a massive search, which led to the creation of the Vermont State Police in 1947. Some people believe that Paula simply ran away or met her fate at the hands of her father. Regardless of beliefs, Paula's case is still unsolved. On October 12, 1950, eight-year-old Paul Jepson disappeared when his mother left him alone to go feed their livestock. Bloodhounds tracked his scent to the same stretch that Paula Weldon was last seen, to no avail. According to Paul's father, the boy told him he felt a strong pull towards the mountain just days before his disappearance. No trace of Paul has ever been found. Sixteen days later, the final disappearance took place when 53-year-old Frida Langer left her campsite for a hike. During the hike, she slipped into a stream and told her companion to wait here for her while she went to go change out of her wet clothing. She never returned to the stream or the camp. A search commenced using helicopters as well as hundreds of volunteers on the ground, but all turned up nothing. Langer's body was found the following spring near Somerset Reservoir, although the area had been carefully searched to no avail following her disappearance. Because of the decomposition, no cause of death was ever determined. Some people attribute the disappearances to wild animals or a possible serial killer, but no conclusive evidence exists in any of these cases. 
eerie similarities between them continued to raise questions, as most were last seen in the late afternoon in the final months of the year. Unexplainable phenomena continues to be reported today on Glossenbury Mountain, as well as the structures that occupy it. Perhaps the most famous legend to come from Vermont is the story of Emily's Bridge, located in Stowe. The bridge is also known as Gold Brook Covert Bridge or Stowe Hollow Bridge. Like many other legends, Emily's Bridge has different versions to the story. One version says that a young woman named Emily was jilted at the altar on her wedding day. She left the church in her family's carriage, devastated about being stood up. She was not really paying attention to where she was going and crashed the carriage into the creek under the bridge, killing herself and the horses. Other stories claim that Emily was supposed to meet her boyfriend that her parents didn't approve of to elope. When he didn't show up, she flung herself off the bridge and drowned. Another version to this one says she hung herself from the rafters. The final version of this legend says that Emily became pregnant out of wedlock and in desperation, she hung herself from the bridge rafters. In the 1970s, a local reporter admitted to making up the legend. Nancy Steed was horrified with the stories of witchcraft which surrounded the bridge at the time because it was making it a popular place for curious tourists and locals, which was leading to loud parties. The only problem with the made-up story is all the paranormal activity that has been reported there since the 1960s. People have reported strange scratching noises on the side of their cars and dragging sounds along the top when driving through the bridge. When checked, they have found what appears to be bloody claw marks on the side and shoe scuffs across the roof. Other people have reported seeing a white apparition floating near the bridge, as well as other unexplainable shadow figures. Some have even claimed to have seen a figure hanging from the rafters. Other reports include the feelings of being watched, sounds of rope tightening and stretching, and the disembodied screams of a woman. Some people have even reported being scratched by something unseen. William Henry Hayden Sr. moved his family to Albany, Vermont in the early 1800s. He had borrowed money from his mother-in-law, Mercy Dale, who was a well-off widow. Mercy moved with the family and helped support them, but William would often squander the family's money away paying for his lavish party lifestyle. He never did pay the loan back he took from his mother-in-law and several years later found himself in serious financial trouble. William asked Mercy for a second loan that he either did not or could not pay back. Angry, Mercy moved out and soon became seriously ill. She believed her illness was caused by William poisoning her. On her deathbed in 1808, Mercy cursed the family, saying the Hayden name shall die in three generations, and the last to bear the name shall die in poverty. Mercy also refused to be buried in the Hayden family cemetery, and instead was interred in the neighbor's family plot. Life went on after Mercy's death, and the curse was forgotten. William's daughters all married and had several children, but the family's luck and fortune quickly took a turn for the worse. All but one of William's sons died young. William Henry Hayden Jr. survived, but slowly started to show signs of erratic behavior. William Sr. and his wife became estranged after he squandered most of the family's money. Eventually, he also lost his sight and at one point had fled to Canada to avoid his creditors. William Sr. died penniless in New York. In 1854, after his father's death, 
William Jr. built an extravagant home for his family. The William Henry Hayden Jr. family soon became the envy of the neighborhood and was known to take regular pleasure rides down South Albany Road in fancy carriages. They also had many servants to fulfill all their needs and often held lavish parties in the new mansion's third-story ballroom. As time passed, William Jr. became more and more unstable. His mother eventually cut him from the will. Henry Jr. died in 1910 of cerebral hemorrhage. His body was carried by a horse-drawn hearse, passing his old home on the way to the cemetery. The curtains in the mansion were all drawn shut in tribute, but by this time the mansion had been empty for 20 years because he could no longer afford to live in it. It was then many people started recalling Mercy's curse, and most believed it has taken its toll on the Hayden family. The only Hayden left was Henry Jr.'s daughter, Armina, also known as Mammy. All that was left of her inheritance was an unsavory family reputation and many unpaid bills. Mammy moved to Waterville, Maine, sick and humiliated, where she died in poverty alone in February of 1927. A family from Canada bought the Hayden Mansion, and soon rumors began that the underground tunnels that Henry Jr. used to smuggle Chinese immigrants was now being used for a large bootlegging operation. The family was also known to hold many dances in the third floor ballroom and enjoyed the social status that this brought. In 1922, they sold the mansion. Most of the following owners found that they did not have enough money to maintain the old mansion and finally the estate was sold piece by piece with other parts being burnt down. What was left of the mansion remained abandoned and fell into major disrepair. It was then the stories began that the old Hayden Mansion on the outskirts of town was haunted. People passing by reported seeing strange lights and hearing music coming from the third floor. Some people believed it to be the ghost of the Chinese immigrants brought in by Henry Jr. Many of those workers were buried in unmarked graves near the mansion. On February 5, 1887, a bitterly cold night, the Montreal Express train departed White River Junction, bound for Montreal. Little did anyone know the impending disaster that would occur. The Montreal Express was late leaving by about two hours, and it is unclear the reason, whether it was due to the cold or mechanical issues. After only traveling about four miles, it began to cross the White River on the West Hartford Bridge. Reports say that the train began to sway with the back cars feeling the worst of it. Suddenly, the real cars came off the tracks, bringing the rest of the train and the bridge with it, tumbling into the icy waters below and catching fire. Tragically, 36 people were crushed, drowned, or burned alive. To date, this was Vermont's worst railroad disaster. The wooden bridge was soon replaced with a steel bridge using the original concrete footings, but the tortured souls of the tragic accident are said to still relive that gruesome event. The most common report from the bridge is of a 13-year-old boy named Joe McCabe. One story says that he watched his father die in the fire. Another says that both the boy and the father perished in the accident. There have been many reports of people seeing the young boy floating above, playing in, or wandering around the river. Other reports from the site include the lingering scent of burning wood, the apparition of a railway worker, and the sounds of wailing, screaming, and cries for help.
The Battleboro Retreat was established in 1834 as the Vermont Asylum for the Insane. It was funded with $10,000 in gifts to establish an independent hospital to care for the mentally ill. The asylum was to offer a humane alternative to other treatments that were dangerous but commonly found around the country. Warm, caring, respectful, and moral treatment for the mentally ill was the hospital's main intent. Through the years, walking paths were created through the surrounding woodlands and patients were taken out on daily outings. A farm was also built to serve as both a means of food and work for the patients who could participate. The first patient arrived on December 12, 1836. Within months, the asylum held 48 patients, and by 1841, new buildings were added and they were able to accommodate 150 patients. A tower was constructed with patient labor in 1887 and was meant to provide a scenic overlook of the asylum grounds. However, many patients used it for a different purpose. They would climb to the top and jump off to their death to the rocky cliffs below. The total number of suicides is now a closely guarded secret. Today, the tower is sealed off to the public. There have been many reports of apparitions seen jumping from the top of the tower and then disappearing just before they hit the ground. Brunswick Springs is located off the main road in Brunswick, Vermont, a small town with about 100 residents. There are six springs at that spot, each containing a different mineral that flows into the Connecticut River. In 1748, the Abenaki natives lived near the spring and used the natural healing powers of the water. During the French and Indian War, a soldier was wounded and the natives brought him back to Brunswick Springs and put him in the water, which is said to have cured him. The soldier returned to the springs after the war to bottle and sell the healing waters, but the natives objected. During the struggle, a native man and child were killed. The child's mother, who was a sorceress, cursed the spring, saying anyone who tried to profit from the spring would fail. Stories of the healing water spread and the first hotel, the Brunswick Spring House, was built in 1860. It was open for a few years, but eventually burnt to the ground. Dr. Rowell purchased the property and rebuilt the hotel in 1894. Shortly after, it burnt down yet again. He rebuilt it, but he died in 1910 after selling to John Hutchinson, who renamed it the Pine Crust Lodge. The hotel caught fire three times in three consecutive years before completely burning down in 1929. Some people have reported seeing the ghost of the sorceress wandering around the Silver Lake area, keeping an eye on things. Residents who live near the spring still believe there is something paranormal about it. Reports from the area say that a woman drove her car into the lake and drowned, and that men are known to commit suicide by hanging themselves in an area overlooking the lake. The legend of Brunswick Springs lives on, and it is believed to be a blessing to those who receive the benefits of the healing waters, but a curse to those who try and obtain financial gain from it. In Evergreen Cemetery of New Haven, Vermont, there is an odd but very intriguing grave belonging to Dr. Timothy Clark Smith. Before his death, the doctor was very worried about accidentally being buried alive, as it was pretty common in those days. He was so scared of contracting the sleeping sickness, which gave the illusion of death, that he had a unique crypt built for his final resting place. Dr. Smith died on October 31, 1893, and was placed to rest in his crypt at Evergreen Cemetery. 
The crip had an odd slab of granite that was placed upon the grassy mound. The marker had a 14 inch by 14 inch window at the surface of the grave, fixed squarely on his face so that people could check on him to make sure he wasn't buried alive. According to cemetery records, there is a second room within the crypt where Timothy's wife is buried. There is a set of stairs that also lead into the crypt that is capped by stone. Dr. Smith's glass window is now weathered, stained, and hazy, which makes it almost impossible to see his remains, but some people have claimed to see his skeletal face through the window just below the surface, along with a hammer and chisel lying on his chest. There is also a breathing tube that flows through the surface and a bell, just in case the doctor happened to wake up. In Northfield, Vermont, the locals tell of a story of a bald, naked man with a pig snout that will chase young couples and attack them. The legend began in the 1950s when a local teenager named Sam Harris went out for a night of mischief on Halloween. Sam never returned home and was never found out what really happened to him. But soon after his disappearance, Pigman began to terrorize the area. Pigman is sometimes described as being covered with white hair and wearing a rotting pig head or mask. Some people claim that Sam sold his soul to the devil and became Pigman, and others say he was the creature's first victim. A few years after his disappearance, a group of teens were drinking near the high school and reported seeing a man-like creature with a pig face come after them from the woods. They ran back into the school dance that was happening and reported it, but nobody believed them. Soon after, the reports of Pigman began to spread. Drivers started claiming that the creature ran out in front of them. Farmers reported seeing it on their property, hunting their livestock. And teens who visited the Devil's Wash Bowl, an area known for its waterfall and caves, reported the beast banging on their cars. There are even reports of bones and cloven hoof prints found in one of the caves. Highgate Manor was built by Captain Steve Keyes in 1818. At one point in its history, it was used as a stop of the Underground Railroad. Runaway slaves would enter the tunnels at the edge of the river and hide in the inn's basement until they could be moved. They say the tunnels still exist today. The Keyes family owned the inn until 1870 when Dr. Henry Baxter bought the house. He ran his medical practice here. Dr. Baxter and his wife had several children, but many never made it past the age of 10. Because most of his children died from unexplainable illnesses, rumors began that Dr. Baxter was experimenting on his own children. Today, bloodstains can still be found on the floor of the library where his medical office was located. During Prohibition, the basement's cave-like room held a speakeasy and hosted famous people, including Al Capone. In recent years, the basement's bar was named after the famous mobster. During the 1940s, big bands often played here at the now Vacation Resort, and they hosted people like Benny Goodman. Today, many people have claimed that if you listen very hard, during the darkest hour of night, you can hear a melody drifting on the wind. Sounds of Music on the Wind is not the only experiences reported from High Great Inn. Other reports include doors randomly opening and closing by themselves. Dr. Baxter's clock, which hasn't been wound in years, is still keeping time. And loud, unexplainable banging sounds phantom footsteps in the middle of the night. In 2015, the inn was sold at auction, so visitors will have to wait for a chance to visit.
The High Life Ski Club Lodge, formerly known as Eddie House, has long been known to be haunted, since 1874 to be exact. It was originally home to Zephaniah Eddie and his children, William, Horatia, and Mary. They were a family of mediums and psychics, but Zephaniah was ashamed of their abilities. When the children were young, they would often vanish from their cribs, play with ghost children, and cause many other disturbances around the house. The children were even kicked out of school because they would make books fly and levitate desks. Their father would often beat them to try to stop their abilities and eventually sold them to a traveling circus where they remained receiving more abuse for 14 years. When Zephaniah died, the children moved back home and turned the house into Green Tavern, an inn for travelers and spirits. The inn had a reputation for being extremely haunted, and nightly seances were held there. Today, it is still reported that ghosts come looking to communicate with the Eddie children. <laughs>